After 15 years of parenting our kids like this, by asking this question to ourselves and having these two non-negotiable rules per se, we would do it this way all over again. Hey, my name is Sarah Short and I'm a busy mom of five kids and after almost two decades of parenting, I'm here to share with you everything I've learned from my triumphs and successes and from my biggest mistakes. Think of me as the mom who's been where you are, remembers how hard, hilarious, and exhausting your days are, and wants to help you navigate your days as a mom with courage and intention, all while fostering amazing relationships with your kids and a home life you love. My Nana once told me, there's no way but through. Turns out she was right in life and in motherhood. So throw in some headphones and come laugh and cry with me as we talk about all things mom. This is the No Way But Through podcast. Welcome back to the No Way But Through podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Short. So glad to be back with you guys again today. It's been a couple of weeks that I've been back here in the new year, and I have just really loved spending time with you guys over on Instagram, messaging you back and forth over there about mom stuff and life with your kids. And I really love our question box and the interactions we have over there. In these last six months that I've been doing this, it's just become such an important and valuable and special part of my days when I'm working on it. I really feel so honored that I get to be here with you and that you let me speak into your lives this way. I don't take a single one of your listens for granted because This was a dream I had for a really long time. I wanted to do this for so long. And now that it's happening and I'm getting to know you guys, I just, I love it so much. Before I get into this week's podcast, I want to wish a very happy 18th birthday to my son, Max. He turns 18 the morning this podcast drops and he is just an amazing kid and Now he's an amazing adult, and I'm just really excited to see how his life unfolds. I have really wrestled with this topic this week. I feel this tension of wanting so much to share this with you and explain this to you and why I care about this so much while also maintaining humility and a respect that not everybody parents this way. And the thing about parenting is that no one has it all figured out. The very best parents I know are wondering if they're getting things right. And as soon as you think you have things figured out, one of your kids throws you for a loop and you can feel like you have no idea what you're doing all over again. If I were to gather all of my friends together and we were all sitting around a table, either just us or us with our husbands, and you were to poll us with different parenting questions or scenarios, you would find that we all parent differently. We all have different priorities and we all use different strategies and different techniques and we value different things. And parenting is always going to be that way. We all come from different places in different kinds of families and we value and prioritize different stuff. And so we help each other and we encourage each other and we cheer for one another and we respect and give each other space to parent the way that we feel like is best for our kids. But as I'm getting older and am now a more experienced mom and have two adult kids, When I used to feel confident about nothing, I'm actually confident about certain things in my parenting now. I've had a lot of years to mess up, course correct, and then get things right. All that to say, on this podcast today, I'm going to share with you the way we have done things and still do them now. And in that, I respect other parents who don't do things the way that we do them. Today, I want to talk to you about an approach, our approach we have towards discipline and consequences. 
this is not an exhaustive look at how we discipline our kids, but something that has been so helpful to us. And now after approaching it this way for 15 years, I love what it has done in my kids and in my family. And I want to tell you in total transparency that I don't love this topic. And the reason that I don't love it is that I don't love it when my kids have to face consequences and I don't love it when they need to be disciplined in some way. It hurts my heart. It breaks my heart. I am, after all, their mom. And after 20 years of parenting now and walking through every stage of childhood, now with two of my kids, there are just a whole lot of other topics that I would rather talk about than discipline and consequences. But what I want to share with you today, how we approach consequences, has so transformed me and Jason as parents when we were very young and very new parents that even though I don't love discipline and I don't love consequences either for my kids or in my own life, I don't love to be disciplined and I don't want to have consequences for my actions, right? But even though I don't love this topic, I know that how we approach this is so important and it's been so important in the development of our kids. And I know it's so important to you guys too as you think about wanting to get this right with your own kids. This wisdom that was shared with us when we were young parents that I'm gonna share with you today, we both loved it so much that we grasped tightly onto it and we applied it and we love what it's produced in our children and how it's fostered trust and safety and a growing maturity in our kids and in us as parents. So y'all, this is me this week being brave with this because pretty much any parent will tell you who's raised kids into adulthood, I got some stuff right and I got some stuff wrong. We got a lot wrong. We got situations wrong. We got certain circumstances wrong. We handled certain situations wrong. We got this wrong sometimes. We didn't always do this day in and day out well. We failed at it sometimes. But these underlying principles on discipline and consequences, when we applied this well, we got it so right. And so I wanna share this with you because I want you to think on it. And I want you to think about your own parenting and your own kids. And I want to help transform your parenting with your little ones the way ours was transformed for us. So today I'm gonna to talk about discipline and consequences on a very basic and very general level and what that looks like in our house. And I'm gonna share two specific things with you today. The first is a question that we ask any time we need to address behavior with our kids or discipline in some way with some kind of consequence. And the second are the two main things or behaviors we never let slide in our house. These are non-negotiables. These are the two things that we always discipline our kids for, that we always address, and they always have a consequence of some sort if they exhibit this particular kind of behavior. That's it really. There are only two. And before I even begin, before I get to that question we ask ourselves and then the two things that we always, every time address with our kids, I'm gonna give you the ending. And that's this. After 15 years of parenting our kids like this, by asking this question to ourselves and having these two non-negotiable rules per se, we would do it this way all over again. We are, as I've mentioned to you often, we're still in it with you. We still have younger kids at home, but we now have two adult children and we have one right on their heels and we see what it's done in them. We really believe in what it's done to our kids and in them and what it's done in their relationships with God and how it's given us strong and healthy relationships with our kids now, with our adults. All right, so let's get into it. 
first, the question we ask. No matter what age our kids are, from the time they were very, very little until now, anytime we would see them or experience them doing what they're not supposed to be doing, or what we would say is disobeying a rule, acting out, behaving badly, we have stopped and asked this question. Is this right here, what's happening right now, a bigger sin issue or struggle we're seeing in them that we really need to parent and address and discipline for? Or are they engaging in age-appropriate behavior that's going to pass in time? This question has helped us so much to parent what matters and let go of the stuff that doesn't. Let me give you an example. So you're sitting at the dinner table and it's Thursday night and the kindergartner in your house is absolutely exhausted from four straight days at school and is sitting at the dinner table and agitated and tired and grouchy and there are three green beans on his or her plate. He doesn't want to eat them. He doesn't want to do anything. At least doesn't want to do anything you want him to do. So you're determined that your five-year-old is going to eat those green beans or they're not getting up from the table and he begins to cry as hot tears stream down his face and he throws the green beans on the floor. You're sitting there at the table as the parents and you look at each other because you just told your five-year-old to eat those green beans and he threw them on the floor. Running through your mind are a dozen ways to handle this, right? Like, what do we do? Do we go with the knee-jerk reaction? Do we think on it? What do we do? This is one of the moments that Jason and I would stop and ask ourselves this question. Are we seeing here a major issue with our child that we need to address? Are we seeing a potentially long-term consequential issue in our child? Or are they acting out because they're five? In other words, am I going to have a 13-year-old that's going to throw green beans on the floor? We stopped and we'd evaluate what's going on and then ask ourselves that question. Are they acting out because of their age? Or is there a major problem here that we need to address? What I'm not going to do is tell you how to address this. I will tell you in this situation, and we have been here before many times, our five-year-old needed to go to bed. This wasn't something we needed to go in hard on with discipline and consequences in that moment. Our child was exhausted and tired and needed an early bedtime, not discipline from their parents. Telling a five-year-old that he needed to choke down three green beans while being utterly exhausted, overwhelmed, and overstimulated from a week of school and needing to sit still in the chair until those green beans were gone a five-year-old boy telling him to do that, it's not going to work out well for us in that moment. And we weren't really going to be teaching him anything about life or anything of long-term importance. By stopping and asking this question, we were able to recognize that what he needed was some intervention. What he needed was a bath and to go to bed. He would wake up in the morning and not be throwing his breakfast on the floor, but would have fresh perspective within a new day as a rested five-year-old. I see your hands raised, but he disobeyed, right? I suppose it could be characterized that way. But if I step back and I look at the situation as the adult at the table, if I take my emotion and my pride out of it, what was happening there was that my five-year-old was tired. And a five-year-old doesn't know how to deal with life when they're tired. He communicated this to me and to his dad in all the ways that he knew how to. Tell us that he was exhausted and tired and overwhelmed. He needed to go to bed, not be punished, 
and not be forced to choke down those green beans. What's important in this situation and what I want to communicate with you about this is that there are one million other situations like this that you can apply this to in your parenting from the time they are two years old all the way up through their teen years. When you stop for just a few seconds as a mom, as a dad, and you ask yourself, am I dealing with a major heart issue here where my child needs correction and I need to go in hard on this green bean scenario? Or is there something else going on because he's five that I can see and recognize? If I can do this, this completely changes the way the whole scenario plays out. The responsibility in this situation and the million others like it and the way Jason and I have always seen this is that the responsibility for figuring this out and evaluating this in the moment should fall on us, not on our child. The easy way out would be to discipline that child for throwing the green beans on the floor. The hard work that's really good work and it's really gonna be beneficial long-term is if you're able to stop for just a few seconds and recognize this is gonna pass. This isn't something to go in hard on in this moment because your pride feels battered that your child didn't obey what you told him to do. This question, this skill, this recognition and being able to do this is something we do now, even all the way up through our adult children. Medical research shows us and tells us that the frontal lobe isn't fully formed until age 25. My friends and I laugh about this all the time because we know that the frontal lobes of our teenagers are not fully formed. What does the frontal lobe do? The frontal lobe is what you use to help determine what the pros and cons of different decisions are, your movements, your problem solving, and your thinking, and your planning. So y'all, we have 18, 19, 20, 23 year olds running around acting crazy and making horrible decisions still. I mean, we did this, right? You wanna talk about our decisions at 20? I know I don't. Recognizing that and knowing that is an important part of being able to parent teenagers and young adults. And it's definitely part of parenting little kids. Here's what I want you to understand from this. Some of the things that our kids do, they're going to outgrow. They're going to stop doing them simply because they get older. The three-year-old that throws their sippy cup across the floor is not going to be throwing a sippy cup across the floor at 15. Y'all, they're gonna be carrying a Stanley cup. They aren't even gonna be drinking from a sippy cup anymore. And let me tell you, you're gonna be hoping they aren't at a party drinking from a Coors Light bottle. Parenting throwing the sippy cup in the same way that you go about parenting other things that do have long-term consequences and that will have long-term life-altering consequences, then you are spending all of this parental energy and all of this angst and all of this time and investment parenting stuff that they're just going to naturally outgrow. That's what I want you to understand and get from this question. It's that some of their behaviors are just age-appropriate behaviors that don't need a bunch of discipline and you don't need to go hard in on it with them. Recognize it for what it is, pause, give yourself time to figure out how to best handle it in that moment, and find out if it's something like exhaustion or maybe just being that age is at the core of what they're doing, and then just move forward. This question has been so valuable to us and it has given us and caused us to stop when we might have freaked out on one of our kids or scared them or broken relationship with them or hurt them emotionally or physically. It just isn't what we want to do as parents. And so this question has been so valuable and practical to us for almost 15 years. 
I want to say this here because this is where we differ from some of our friends in how we parent. We do not put everything our kids do under the label of disobedience and conclude that all disobedience requires major discipline. We just don't. Disobedience matters. It really does matter when they're little and they need to obey and not run in the street when a car is coming. And I am not saying that disobedience is okay. But what I am saying is that sometimes what we might deem as disobedience is a tired kid. What we might put underneath the umbrella of disobedience is a three-year-old acting like a three-year-old. Asking this question has helped us to be able to determine the difference And it has served us so well as we've guided our kids for the last almost two decades. Is this something I need to go in hard on? Or is this an age-appropriate behavior that requires another kind of guidance from us? Okay, so now that I've told you this question that we pause and we ask ourselves and have been asking for all of these years, almost all of our parenting, there are two things that when we see these two things, we address every single time. And every single time, there's a longer conversation and there's almost always a consequence. This was not an idea or concept original to me or to Jason. Let me give you a quick backstory. When I had Jack and Max, they were little toddlers. I believe Jack was three and Max was maybe two or almost two. We were living out in Michigan, and I began attending MOPS, which is Moms of Preschoolers at our church. We met every Tuesday morning, and I think I was pregnant with Lincoln at the time, and I would load up my two little toddler boys in snow boots and snow suits and everything we needed to go to church in Michigan, which it's just wild for me to think about that. Like, we needed a freaking snow suit to go to church sometimes because the snow was so insane out there, and the parking lot just to get into the building was bananas. Anyway, I would head to Mops every Tuesday morning. I loved Mops because there was breakfast there. And once a semester, I had to bring something. But otherwise, I rolled in there with my kids, had a great breakfast and a couple of hours of time with other moms who were in my stage of life. And it was really when I first began to make friends in Michigan. One Tuesday morning, our senior pastor came and he spoke to our Mops group. In the two years that I was in MOPS up there in Michigan, I can't really tell you anything else that any other speaker said in the two years that I was there. But I will never forget when our senior pastor, whose name was Jeff Mannion, came and spoke with us about parenting. I actually don't remember most of his talk. He had three or four teenagers at the time, young adults, and I knew that they were stellar humans. And so when he shared this with me, when he shared that there were two things in their house that they took very seriously and always addressed when they saw it in their kids and always went in hard on with their kids when they saw it, I listened. And I knew when I heard this that I would never forget them because it was so profound and it impacted me so deeply that I came home and I immediately told Jason. And this is how we have parented our kids for the last almost 20 years now. There are two things we really, really care about around here when it comes to our kids' behavior and how they act and what we major on. When we see either of these two things in our kids in any situation, we always address it. We always discipline it. And we always spend time explaining it to them and helping them see why it's not okay and what it does in them now and what it will do in them later. Here they are. Number one is deceit. And number two is disrespect. Let's talk about these two for just a minute. Let's start with deceit. Deceit is utterly destructive. 
if deceit begins to take root in our kids and it becomes a regular pattern, it doesn't matter if they are three years old or 18 years old or 40 or 80. Deceit destroys relationships. Deceit was the very thing Satan used in the garden to corrupt and attempt to destroy God's very first children, Adam and Eve. Lying and hiding and being deceitful has long-term, life-altering implications. It isn't about the candy that you stole from the cabinet at three years old. It isn't about the candy. It's about the heart that took it and hid. It isn't about the zero that they get in school on an assignment or five assignments and their grade plummets in the class because they told us they'd finished their homework and didn't. It's about their heart that lied and deceived us when we asked if the homework was finished and they said yes. It isn't about the phone being upstairs in the bedroom at 13 when it's supposed to be downstairs and plugged in. It's about the heart that came down the stairs and snuck it upstairs and engaged in devastating behavior that has long-term consequences from being on a phone in the middle of the night in the dark. If you let deceit go, if it goes unchecked and unaddressed, if it's treated the same as everything else, all the other ways they mess up and all the things they do that are irritating or annoying or disruptive or you disobeyed me. If deceit goes unchecked, it can have lifelong consequences to their hearts and souls. If stealing the candy from the cabinet is treated as no big deal or lost in the myriad of other things they're always getting in trouble for, then they may believe that stealing the candy from the grocery store is no big deal, or stealing from the cash register isn't either, or fudging the numbers on a spreadsheet is okay if no one notices. If they don't finish their assignments and they get a zero and they told you they'd finished it, when they tell their boss they've done something and completed it and they haven't, it can have dire consequences on their employment and crush their family. When they sneak a phone upstairs late at night, when it's supposed to be plugged in downstairs, and they use it in ways that are destructive to their hearts, and that goes unchecked or unaddressed or thrown in the same category as everything else, then their hearts might be trained to think it's okay to sneak out at night when they're married and engage in destructive behavior. Do you get my point? Deceit, lying, deception, not being true to your word, it needs our guidance. It needs and demands our attention and for it to really matter to us as their parents. Lying and being deceitful can get you kicked out of college. It can make you lose your job. It can land you in jail. You can lose your family and the relationships and the people closest to you. Deceit wreaks havoc on lives and hearts and people. So when they are three and they take a candy from the jar and say they didn't do it, we take it seriously, really seriously. This isn't a three-year-old issue. This is a heart issue, and this begs us as parents to intervene. We use age-appropriate words and consequences to help them begin to understand why it matters. If they cheat in school or lie to us about their phone or where they've been or what they've been doing, we want to do everything we can to address it and help them see why they need to stop it before it becomes a pattern. To help them see what deceit does to us and to others and how it breaks the heart of God. For the last 15 years, we have parented deceit as a really, really big deal. It always matters. It always requires and demands our attention and consequences. 
That leads me to number two. The second big thing that we address every time when we see it and is something we really just do not allow to go unchecked here in our home is disrespect. Why disrespect? Why not disobedience? Why not doing what you're told? I remember Pastor Mannion saying all those years ago in that Mops talk that allowing disrespect damages relationships. It is so important that our kids learn how to respect us and one another and others because it teaches them to honor and value people. We want our kids to honor other people. We want them to honor their siblings, the people they live with day in and day out. We want them to honor their friends at school and church. We want them to honor our friends and they, we want them to honor us as parents. Let me make something clear here. This is not politeness. I am not talking about being polite because I know a lot of people who were taught how to be polite and never taught to honor others. I'm talking about showing honor to other people, not just in the way that you talk to them, but the way you act towards them. And by the way that you put others before yourself, the way you stand up for the marginalized and recognize and honor the image of God in everyone. Jason and I have always felt that the responsibility of modeling this to our kids should rightfully fall onto our shoulders. We should be respectful in the way we talk about other people. We should model for them what it looks like to disagree with someone and honor and respect them when we're talking about any subject or anyone at all around our dinner table, right? When you teach and model for your kids what it looks like to respect others and you require it of them from a very young age, they learn to identify what it looks like when someone is not being respected. We want our kids to be able to see that others are created in the image of God and they are worthy of respect. And when they see the image of God is being disrespected in someone else, when they see injustice, when they see abuse or mistreatment, we want them to be able to see it and know it and call it out and not stand for it. I told you before that we don't have this main role at our house that you have to obey. That is just not one of the two main things we really focus on. And part of that is that if you elevate respect and you major on respect and you model it in the way that you talk about and treat others who don't live in your home, and if you require it of your kids in the way that they interact with each other and with you, then their desire for obedience likely follows. It is easy to obey someone you respect. Your heart begins to want to obey someone that you respect and, of course, that respects you. Here is something else that I think is just so important. You know, Jason and I both grew up in environments where compliance with the system and the rules was top dog. You needed to comply. And you needed to comply even if you didn't understand why you needed to comply. How many times did we hear, because I said so? This was modeled for both of us in and throughout our faith communities. But you know what? Sometimes systems are bad. Sometimes people are bad. Sometimes parents' systems and parents are bad, and they should be challenged. I tell you guys all the time that my kids have taught me so much. And part of it is that I have, as a parent, as a mom, I brought brokenness into my relationship with my children. 
I brought unhealthy patterns into my life as a parent because of what was modeled for me and the sin even in my own heart. And sometimes my kids see that and they call this out and they should. It is good for them to do that respectfully. Yes, of course. But sometimes systems in their lives need to be challenged. Compliance is not always the answer when you're sitting under the authority of someone else. You guys know this, right? If someone's asking you to do something that's wrong, dishonoring another human being, something that's illegal or unethical, don't you want your kids to be able to stand up and say, I'm not okay with this? We expect our kids to be respectful to us. We require that of them in our home. And not just us. We expect them to honor us and their siblings and their friends and our friends and other parents and adults in the way they interact with them and how they show honor to others. And we do all of this because we teach our kids that we want them to honor God. And the way that they can honor God is by loving and honoring others as well too. By putting others first, by giving them dignity and showing them respect. And we teach our kids here in our house that at the heart, at the center of all of this is that God bestowed such incredible honor on us by creating us first, then by sending his son to die for us in laying down his life for us. Jesus is the greatest example of showing respect and honor to his children and to others. You can't tell your kids to honor God and they'll just do it. I wish it worked that way, but it doesn't. We teach them that God is worthy of that honor because he's our Lord and Savior and friend. And that the way we treat and act towards others every day in every situation should be a reflection of the love that he's bestowed upon us. Home, this is where they practice this over and over and over again. We always address disrespect towards us and towards their siblings because disrespect damages relationships. It breaks relationships. We want them to grow up into adults who love and honor others. So we practice it here. We address it when it's not there. And when it goes haywire, it isn't going right. We stop and we address it, and we talk about how important it is, and we dish out consequences at times, and then we move forward together. I want to say one last thing here about disrespect, and I really want you to listen to me here on this one, okay? There is a difference between your kids being disrespectful and you feeling disrespected. We can feel disrespected when our kids don't act the way we want them to act. You could throw everything they do wrong, like the throwing of the sippy cup, underneath this header of disrespect and say, every single thing they do wrong, I'm filing here under disrespect, so I'm going to punish them for it all. If you do that, you miss the gift of not needing all the rules of not needing to discipline every single thing the same way all the time. Feeling disrespected as a parent can be really, really hard. I'll tell you that from my own experience as a mom. We feel entitled to their respect and we can conflate that with when we feel disrespected especially when we're out in public and they do something in front of other people or in front of our friends at church or at the grocery store or whatever that makes us feel disrespected. One of the things that we've really worked hard on as parents, Jason and I over here, is that we never want our kids to see us do this or think we're going to freak out or lash out or be angry at them because of our reputation ever. We want them to know that we are first for them. 
We want them to know we care about them and our relationship with them, and we understand and love them as our most important people. We want to nudge them and push them and guide them towards Jesus, towards hearts that reflect His heart, towards hearts that are honest, hearts that respect and value others in the relationships in their lives. So those are the two things in our house that we address every single time with our kids. You know, I've had a lot of conversations with other moms over the years, and I've even had conversations with parents that are my age now. There's, there's a lot of parenting that says, you obey every time, all the time, right away. Delayed obedience is disobedience, and we're going to crack down on everything all the time. Every time we see our kids doing something wrong, we're going to be on top of it because we do not allow disobedience around here at all, ever, for any little thing. Does that sound exaggerated? It's not. I've heard it. Maybe you even think this way and think think this is the way you need to parent to have any hope of having kids that aren't hellions because it's how you were parented or you think this is the best way because it's how you want to parent it because compliance is really, really important to you. But if you don't intentionally go about figuring out what it is that you really, really care about in disciplining your kids, what really matters and what you know is going to have long-term effect on them, If you don't intentionally stop and say, this is what we're going to care about around here, then your parenting is going to look like a game of whack-a-mole all the time, trying to make it all matter equally all day, every day. And your kids, they will find ways to just get you off of their backs because they feel like all they're doing is messing up all the time and they just want to get around it. If you want kids who are tender to you, kids who are willing to be taught and open to guidance, open to your wisdom, and even open to your discipline, then they can't have all of these rules and all of this fear and all of this judgment that they feel like you're constantly passing down onto them all the time with everything they do. They will put on a shell. They will put on a shell that makes it hard for you to crack into. They'll put on a shell to protect themselves from the constant barrage of rules and correction. And you're not doing this right. And I told you not to do this. And you're not doing that right. And I need you to do this. And I need you to do that. And you need to obey. And you're not, you're not, you're not, you're not. But if you focus on the things that truly matter, the things that can get into their hearts and hurt them from the inside out, if you focus on the long game, helping to mold their hearts and point them towards their Savior and love them big in it and teach them how to love and respect others by not being deceitful and by honoring other people and honoring God, then their hearts are safe to stay tender. They won't need the shell. They will know what you care about and they will know why. And they will still mess up. They will mess up over and over again, but they will know what and why it matters. But if there's all these roles and everything matters the same to you, I mean, you know as adults that we can't keep all the roles. But if we expect our kids to do that, if we do that to them, then they will continue to put on a shell layer after layer after layer, and they won't be tender to your correction. But that shell will become so thick and so sturdy that the only way you'll be able to get through to them is with a hammer, if you're even able to get through to them at all. I want those little ones that you're holding right now or that are running around in those diapers in your house to stay tender to you. You know, I grew up with spare the rod, spoil the child, and you guys might have too. And now I hear about gentle parenting and that isn't it either. 
It can be hard to keep up with all of it, right? It can be hard to even want to talk about any of it because you don't want to be labeled or siloed into some kind of theory about how you're parenting your kids. Gosh, I don't want that. Our kids aren't the objects of a theory. Our kids are people made in the image of God, worthy of our best work, our focused intention and parenting that sees the long game. So if you only remember three things from this podcast today, this is what I want you to remember and take from this one. Ask the question, is my child in this moment acting out in a way that I need to address and deal with and discipline and go hard in on with them because I see something that could have long-term implications in their lives and hearts and relationships with others and their relationship with God? That's the first thing. And the second thing is that we have two things that we've decided are the two things that we are always going to care about, always going to address, always going to stop what we were, are doing and have conversations with our kids. And they're going to experience consequences because of these. And that's deceit and disrespect. What I would love for you to do is for you to stop and maybe talk with your husband or talk with your wife and just spend some time thinking about what are the things that we really, really care about What are the things our kids do that affect other things? What are the things I'm going to care about in them when they stop throwing their sippy cups and they stop bonking their sibling on the head with their toys and they stop writhing around on the floor in a temper tantrum? What am I truly going to care about seeing in them when they're 20, when they're young adults, when they're married? When they're living with someone they love, what is it that I want to see in them? I'd love to suggest the importance of intentionally parenting the ones I've mentioned here today, deceit and disrespect, because we have seen the good this has done in our own parenting. But see if you can boil the answers to those questions down to a couple of things that throughout the 18 years that your kids are living with you, what are you going to work on and develop in them and point out when they're not doing it well? What is important to you? If you can do this, it will keep you from playing whack-a-mole all the time with everything your kids are doing and feeling like everything's got to be addressed all the time and that all you're ever doing at home is disciplining and correcting your kids. And instead, you then know what to look for. You know what matters. You know what you can let go of. You know what doesn't require a big conversation, a total freak out, but you know what matters for their long-term good. You know what matters to God. And so it matters to you and you want it to matter to them. Oh, y'all, I need to like go hug my kids now that I've finished this podcast. This parenting stuff can be hard and heavy, but what an honor, right? We get to help mold and guide these amazing people God's given us. What a gift. That's it for today. I'll see you guys next time on the No Way But Through podcast. You've just listened to another episode of the No Way But Through podcast. If you want to connect with other like-minded moms and join our growing online community, head on over to Instagram and follow along with us at No Way But Through. You can always reach me over there throughout the week. And if you'd like to financially support this podcast, there's a link at the bottom of every episode where you can do just that.